So without for any further ado, I, I would like to now uh, present to you our first speaker, who is Mark Pagel. Um, Mark. Uh, professor Pagel is a professor in the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Reading. Um, uh, I'm quite a fan of his work because he's one of the first people who proved um, the, on a molecular basis that there is evidence for punctuated equilibria, that it is not just the pattern that we can see in the fossil record. He went on uh, in collaboration with Quinton Atkinson, who's also speaking at this conference, to prove that that pattern can also be found in language evolution. And uh, unfortunately, he's not going to be talking to, uh, about that today, but he's going to be talking about cultural evolution. Um, uh, last year, he, he published a book called Wired for Culture, and uh, he's going to be talking about these ideas, and the title of his talk is The Cultural Survival Vehicle. Um, I want to thank uh, Natalie for organizing this conference. Um, it's a really timely conference, and I look forward to discussion over the next few days. I also want to thank Professors Fonseca and Pombo for their remarks as well. Now, Natalie is very interested in having us identify evolutionary patterns and in attempting a sort of unification and synthesis of biological and cultural sciences. And towards that end, I want to talk to you today about something that I think is a feature of human, our human species, that unifies our biological and cultural evolution. And what I have in mind is a extraordinary set of evolved tendencies in our species to construct and then defend small tribal societies to which we show a striking and sometimes alarming allegiance and devotion. And I call these small tribal societies cultural survival vehicles to emphasize the fact that they have really functioned throughout our evolution as a second body tantamount to our biological body a second body that almost wraps us in a protective layer, not of skin, but of knowledge and skills and technologies and cooperative people who help defend us as part of our society, part of that body, against other cultural survival vehicles competing for the same lands and resources. And I think this attachment, this part of our psychology, is enormously responsible for large parts of our biological, physiological, morphological, and cultural evolution. These pictures here are just to give you a sense of the nature of that tribal identification and allegiance. And what I'm hoping to capture with these pictures is the sense of how we, as individuals, subordinate our individuality to the tribal group. So in each of these cases, you see people who are dressed up in funny colors and so on, in funny costumes, projecting their identity, not as individuals, but as part of a group to which they show probably without even understanding how or where it came from, this striking degree of allegiance and devotion. And I'll try to illustrate some of that uh, in my talk over the next few minutes. We can even see it on the streets of Lisbon, because here, of course, is the Iberian Mask Festival, where people are dressing up and, again, projecting a sort of Iberian identity. Okay, so just to sort of summarize where we're going to go, and I'll read this to you, because I don't know if you'll be able to see it, uh, you antisocial people in the back. Um, that the cultural survival vehicle, this thing I, I think is a real part of our psychology and social evolution, is the, I think the fundamental environment of human existence throughout our history. Homo sapiens is adapted to this environment, I say. It's the most powerful means, this cultural survival vehicle, our tribal societies. It's the most powerful means ever evolved, I think, for convert, converting new lands and resources into more humans and their genes. So it's enormously responsible for our survival, our protection, our prosperity, and our reproduction, this vehicle. And I'll give you examples of that throughout the talk. It provides unsurpassed protection and prosperity. When I'm, by unsurpassed, I mean in connection to all other animals. In return, it commands our allegiance. So what do we give this thing? Uh, we give it the, our powerful sort of tribal identities, and we willingly grant that in return for the advantages this vehicle gives us. It sculpts our morphology, we'll see this in a moment, our physiology, our sociology, and our psychology. And so in that sense, I think it really does unify our genetic and our cultural evolution. And last, I say it's responsible for, and I say is it the cause of, I think, what makes us human, uh, our cooperation, language, religion, and the arts, and individual differences. And I discuss all of these things in detail in my book, but today what I'll do, it's the very end of the talk, is focus on how I think this cultural survival vehicle has sculpted 
individual differences, real genetic differences amongst us. Okay, let's just get a sense of, of what the manifestations of this cultural survival vehicle are. And we all, we all know that slightly strangely and weirdly as a species, we will dress up in silly matching shirts and go to sporting events where we'll, where we'll stand alongside people we've never met in very close proximity for hours at a time, but we all share the identity of being a member of some group, which is in this case is supporting some team. And we direct our identities in the form of cooperation with each other, but also in the form of competition with the other people dressed in a different set of silly matching shirts across the stadium from us. And so here again, we're seeing the manifestation in our modern behavior of this sort of tribal identity. These are silly shirts. We do silly things when we dress up that way, but the group somehow um, sanctions this kind of behavior. Indeed, it's so strong that I think we can feel that we somehow subordinate our entire identity to the group. And this man, I think, painted to become the national flag of his society is somehow showing you that he is just an individual in this larger vehicle to which he has granted his allegiance and devotion. Indeed, I think that the power of this attachment that we have to our sort of tribal origins is so great that we can think it's tantamount to what animal ethologists used to call imprinting before that term was grabbed by geneticists. And the animal ethologists used to think of imprinting in the following way. You'll probably all remember the old photographs of the ethologist Conrad Lorenz, who discovered that if he was around some baby ducks when they hatched, if those ducks' parents had died or gone away for some reason, just weren't in the vicinity, when those ducks hatched, they would, he called it, imprint on him, somehow see, them, see him as their um, parent, and he could get out of the water and walk around and those ducks would follow him, even so far as following up the street. And I think in some ways we imprint on our society, the society into which we are born, in a way that is really quite similar to imprinting in animals, and in a way that's difficult to shake off. It's difficult for us ever to relinquish that tribal identity once it's been inculcated into us by our parents from birth. It's something that's alarmingly easy to teach to children is this sort of tribal identity. And yet what you should all realize is that it's a completely arbitrary identity. Each one of you could have been born somebody else and you'd have an equally strong identity into whatever culture it was you were born. Now, these cultural survival vehicles are capable of, of, of extraordinary and sublime acts of coordinated activity. And you might say that, well, lots of animals can do coordinated activity like birds flying around in flocks or, or killer whales in their kind of circling motion when they catch fish and so on. But what's extraordinary about human society is that we can engage in these sublime coordinated behaviors where the behaviors are things we've never done before. They're not part of our natural repertoire. We seem to get great pleasure out of group activity, coordinated group activity, and especially when that activity is directed at vanquishing some foe. So here again, we're seeing that this vehicle somehow acts in a way to coordinate our activities, often in competition with other vehicles competing for the same resources. And in some sense, all of our sporting events are just socially sanctioned behaviors of our old tribal identities playing out around the world. Somewhat chillingly, um, the group can sanction normative behaviors, behaviors that if you did them individually, you would be seen as, as sort of crazy, a nutcase, a mental case. But within the group, your behavior is seen as normative. It's OK. You can do it. And the group somehow sanctions this odd, peculiar behavior. Well, part of being a member of this sort of cultural survival vehicle is that we are all in this vehicle together, cooperating almost like cells in a body, or bees in a hive, or ants in a colony, to promote and project this vehicle. And so we see that those of us within our society show great cooperation towards people we've never met and who could never repay our kindness. So we have this, this 
strange altruistic behavior that we show all the time. We hold doors open for people we've never met and we'll never see again and who might never hold a door open for us. We give up our seats on trains and buses and so on, again, without any hope of this being reciprocated. And all of you, the trouble with speaking to humans is all of you take this completely for granted, but I put it to you, imagine that this room right now was full of 150 dogs or baboons. They wouldn't be sitting here behaving so naturally, socially, cooperatively, and altruistically as you, and you'll never see a gorilla or a chimpanzee, your close genetic relatives, hold a door for someone or give up their seat on a train for someone. And yet, these are deep parts of our behavior that we, we do without even thinking and take utterly for granted. And elsewhere, I've argued that these behaviors can be seen as, in some sense, um, I hope you can see that, our altruism is sort of the price of admission to the shared knowledge, technologies, and cooperation of the cultural survival vehicle. We engage in these altruistic behaviors as a way of advertising and broadcasting to those around us that we're the sort of person who belongs in this cooperative vehicle. We can be trusted to do things that might be costly to us and endanger our health and well-being. And so I think that we have deep inside us a set of emotions that brings us joy and happiness in being helpful. So strong are those emotions that we can even make the mistake of directing those emotions towards members of other species. And you can see this here in the rather rash behavior of a man last year. I hope you can see that in England. Uh, last year it got very cold in the winter and one of our rivers froze over or nearly froze over. This man's dog, um, which you can barely see here, wandered out onto this river and fell in. So the man risked his life, took off all his clothes except for his pants, took off all his clothes and wandered out onto the ice to save his dog. Now this is crazy. This man was endangering his life and his future reproductive cells to save a set of genes that hasn't been coordinate with his for millions and millions and millions of years, the genes of his dog. But that just shows you how deeply helpfulness and cooperativeness is as a part of our psychology because it's a, it's a set of behaviors that brings us returns in the form of help and cooperation from others. And so somewhat less sort of facetiously or more seriously, we see people doing things that can really endanger their health. This man here has donated a kidney to this young woman whom he's never met and who's never going to give him a kidney back. Uh, he's done that just because it probably makes him feel good to do it. And it can extend this behavior even to risking our lives um, in war to protect our cultural survival vehicle. Um, here are pictures from World War I or World War II. And we might even give up our life in support of an idea, as this monk is doing here, who doused himself with petrol and set himself alight. But it isn't all good news in the cultural survival vehicle. It isn't all about being happy and cooperative and altruistic because the flip side of the cultural survival vehicle is that the mask of our cooperativeness and altruism falls away immediately. Our morality falls away immediately when we start to direct our behavior towards members of competing survival vehicles. And so the flip side of our cooperation is that we're equally just as predisposed to be ethnocentric, racist, and xenophobic. It's something we cannot escape as a deep part of our nature. And if we look around the world right now, there are hundreds and thousands of people suffering from what is effectively tribal competition all over the world in the form of religious wars, ethnic wars, racial hatred, or the, just this good old-fashioned right-wing racism here. And this is a deep part of human nature that isn't confined just to some few nutballs, but it happens all over the world. And nearly all of us, I think, could be provoked to this kind of behavior in, in times of great stress or duress. So much so that behaviors that we most strongly prohibit within our societies, killing someone, become sanctioned when those people show that they have violated what we regard to be the rules of our cooperative society. And this famous photograph here 
is of a Vietnamese uh, man, I think he was a police officer, or he's a general in the Vietnamese army, um, pulling out a gun and assassinating um, a man instantly in the street that he thought was a Viet Cong uh, guerrilla fighter during the Vietnam War. This happened live on television. Um, he saw the man, decided that he was a foe, an enemy, just pulled out his gun and shot him in the head instantly. Now, if this sort of behavior happened within our society or tribe, it's the ultimate sanction. But many people regarded him as a hero for doing that. Life is cheap in the cultural survival vehicle. If you break the rules of that vehicle, you can lose your life. This man here doesn't know it, but he's about to die and over something really rather trivial. Um, this man here is about to hit him so hard in the face that he's going to fall down and crack his head on the floor and die, all because this lady here shouted that he had jumped the queue. He'd gone to the front of the queue. He hadn't waited his turn to buy a packet of cigarettes. And when you break the rules of the tribal society, the worst sort of behavior can emerge. Okay, so I think that this is a deep part of our psychology, and it, it, we want to see if it really has influenced us sort of biologically and genetically around the world. And so let's have a look at when perhaps this set of behaviors evolved. And this is just suggestive. We can have a look at this slide here, which sort of charts the evolution over the last two million years of our genus, Homo, us being Homo sapiens. And what I want you to see here is that all of these species that you'll be familiar with, Homo erectus, Homo neanderthalensis, and so on, all of these species, the width of those sort of irregular shapes on, that, uh, on this figure, the width of them is showing the sort of geographical extent of those species, where they're found around the world. And then something strange happens right around here, somewhere around 150 to 200,000 years ago, this new species arises and instantly, almost instantly, spreads out around the entire world. So what is the difference? Whereas all of these species are confined to regions of the world that their genes adapt them to, this new species emerged that could adapt at the cultural level in its tribal societies by acquiring knowledge and technologies and skills, and instantly, in, in terms of evolutionary time, that species spread out almost like a mushroom cloud. And I use that term advisedly because of the effect we have had on the world, spread out around the world. And it's reasonable to suppose that our kind of capacity for culture evolved about there. And this was where we started to shape the sort of psychology that really makes us human and defines our sort of tribal identities. And so, what I want to suggest now is that around the world, these various tribal groups that have evolved have behaved almost like distinct biological species. Now let's have a look. The first thing we recognize is that once we evolved and spread out around the world, we left behind a remarkable, just striking degree of diversity around the world. Now, these are all human beings. We all recognize that. But if we were to see these photographs of any other collection of organisms, I think we would be inclined to say they came from different biological species. These individuals are more different at the cultural level than many biological species are at the genetic level. And so we left this extraordinary degree of diversity around the world where these tribal societies were adapting to their local surroundings. So much diversity that even today there are still something on the order, those red dots are distinct uh, languages. Even today, there are still something on the order of 7,000 to 8,000 um, uh, mutually incomprehensible human languages spoken around the world. Each one of these representing uh, a different tribal society with its own customs, beliefs, religion, obviously language, uh, knowledge, skills, technologies, and, and so on. Now, many of you looking at this slide might say, well, it's just, there's nothing really to explain there. As humans spread out around the world and they diverged geographically, it's just natural that they would diverge culturally. That's just what we do. We know our languages diverge and so on. Yet this ignores the fact that the greatest diversity of languages is found not where people are most spread out, but where people are most closely packed together. 
where you push people most closely together is where you find the greatest diversity of languages, almost as if these tribal societies are resisting each other's encroachment on their territories. And to see that, we can go to the island of Papua New Guinea, and this relatively small island about the size of the American state of Texas is home to 850 to 1,000 different human languages. That's about, you know, one in seven or one in eight of all languages spoken on Earth are found on this relatively small landmass. And there are some parts, if you can see, there are some parts of the, the sort of uh, northeastern coastal regions in here of Papua New Guinea, and here, here's this enlargement of it here, some regions along this northeastern coast where you can find a different tribal society, a different language group, every few kilometers. Every few kilometers, you just walk along the coast and you will bump into a different language spoken every few kilometers. And when I first discovered this, I was, I was just astonished by this and I didn't believe it. And I had the great fortune to meet a man who was a, a Papuan man who was from this region. And I asked him, I said, could this possibly be true? And he just looked at me and he said, he said, oh no, they're far closer together than that. And sure enough, if you look here, here's a different language group every few kilometers. If you go around the corner here, you can see a whole lot of languages. I hope you can see that almost on top of each other. And so something really remarkable is going on here. And this is this tendency to form these small tribal groups that defend themselves uh, to such a degree that even pushed together in this tiny little area, they maintain their identities um, uh, against other tribal groups living next door. So much so that we can now study them almost as if they're biological species and we see that human tribal groups divide up the landscape, the, the real biological world, just like biological species do. So what this slide shows is a plot of, um, in, in the red dots, the number of different biological species, mammals, for each degree of latitude in North America. So we had some information on how many different mammal species were found at, at each degree of latitude in North America. And we can see that it, uh, there's not very many species down in the lower latitudes, and then you go up to a peak, and then you fall away. But what's really striking is that we also plotted the number of different language groups per degree of latitude in North America, and you can see that they almost fall on top of each other. Now, North America has a really irregular shape, and so what you want to do is control for the area of that continent, and when you plot then the density of, of biological species and the density of human languages per uh, degree of latitude, you see that they virtually fall on top of each other. It seems that the human tribal groups are dividing up the landscape almost as if they were distinct biological organisms. And this is real because we have, in moving around the world in these tribal societies, you might say suffered or you might say enjoyed a real sculpting of our physiology and morphology. So if we have a look at, at this species, or this, this slide, we're very happy to look at a gorilla and a panda and a polar bear and, and these um, buffalo and think of them as distinct biological species. But I want to put it to you that in some ways we have been sculpted by our life in our cultural groups that have taken us to different environments around the world such that this Inuit man has a short and stocky body that has been sculpted genetically to survive in the very, very cold climates of North America living on the ice his body is designed to conserve heat. But this Dinka man here from the Sudan, one of the most uh, harsh and deprived environments on earth, these men average six feet in height and you can see that his spaghetti-like body is designed to lose heat, exactly the opposite of this Inuit man. Now these are real genetic differences brought about by the various tribal groups that they've lived in, and those tribal groups have taken them to different places on Earth. If you raise an Inuit man in the Sudan, he doesn't come out looking like a Dinka tribesman, and if you raise a Dinka tribesman in the far north of North America, he doesn't come out looking like an Inuit. These are real genetic differences. This lady here lives up above 12,000 feet 
in, in Tibet, and she carries a very special genetic adaptation that allows her to breathe at those levels, levels that if most of us went to, we would feel ill um, the entire time. So our, we divide up the landscape almost as if we're separate biological organisms and our, um, we have been sculpted genetically and physiologically by our membership in these, in these groups. So just to summarize that, and again, I'll, I'll read this if it, if it is too small. Humans have occupied the world in highly adaptable cultural survival vehicles that they provide protection and prosperity not available to other species. We've had unchecked population growth throughout our history. To spread out and occupy the entire world, you have to be creating enough individuals that when you move to some new spot, others are left behind. So we've had unchecked population growth throughout our history, and that's because of the um, prosperity that has become available to us as part of our cultural tribal groups. We behave something like distinct biological species. They've sculpted us genetically, morphologically, physiologically, and behaviorally around the world. Each one of those is distinguished by language, art, religion, customs, and beliefs. They're characterized by a unique, what I call, hypersociality, this strange altruism that we practice all the time that no other species does. And our hypersociality really rivals, and I would argue exceeds that of the social insects, the ants, the bees, the termites, and the wasps, and so on. Because whereas those species are all related to each other, brothers and sisters, our tribal groups are largely um, composed of people who are not closely related to each other. Okay, so um, our, our cultural groups also allow for specialization and exchange of goods within our societies. We can trade and exchange things within our societies in a way that other species don't do. We can specialize and do things in a way that other species don't do. And so here's a conjecture that unique features of the cultural survival vehicle can explain why language evolved, why we have morality, religion, and the arts. And I talk about all these things in my book, Human Cooperation, but what I want to go on to now is to show you how we can use a suggestion like this to explain what would otherwise be a puzzling feature um, of our species, and that's our, our individual differences. And so if we want to try to unify things, we've got to take ideas and apply them to areas that otherwise are just puzzling to us and see if they can provide some explanation. So what I want to turn to, and just in the last part of the talk, is um, what we might call culture and microevolution, the puzzle of heritability. Now, um, twin studies over many, many decades have shown that just about anything you can measure and measure accurately about humans shows some degree of heritability, a heritability that we can attribute probably to genetic causes. And that's by comparing identical twins with fraternal twins. And so, for example, if we just have a look at some typical sorts of things, height is highly heritable. Um, IQ and components of IQ are, tend to be highly heritable. I don't want to argue about the exact numbers here. They vary from study to study, but over and over and over again, traits like this are highly heritable. Um, things that we might call talents, um, mathematical ability, musical ability, other sorts of talents seem to be highly heritable. And again, this is by comparing identical twins reared apart with fraternal twins reared apart. And so there's attempts to control for the environment, cultural um, environment, social environment, and so on. Psychological traits like extroversion, authoritarianism, religiosity, antisocial behavior. But, you know, nicely, specific religion, we don't expect anyone to have a heritable gene for a specific religion, so things that shouldn't be heritable seem not to be. But it's, there's a sort of rule of, th rule of thumb with humans that just about anything you measure will have a heritability of around 0.5. And the revealing thing is that the better we can measure a trait, the more accurately we can measure something, the more reliably we can measure something, the higher the heritability seems to be. And so we can, we can um, debate as to what it is the IQ test actually measures, but whatever it is that it does measure, it measures reliably. We can give that IQ test over and over and over again and get similar scores. And sure enough, the things that we can measure reliably seem to have high heritabilities. Almost as if to say, the things we cannot measure, they might indeed have high heritabilities, but we measure them so badly that we lose the signal for all of the error. 
Okay, so here's some typical heritability values of human traits um, from twin studies. But there's a puzzle here for this heritability. Heritability is a characteristic of a population. For something to be heritable, people who are high on some trait have to have children who are high on some trait. People who are low on some trait have to have children who are low on some trait and so on. So for a trait to be highly heritable, individuals have to differ and their differences need to be attributable to inherited genetic factors. And there's all manner of research done on heritability. Most psychologists and sociologists simply accept it as a part of human existence. Many other people wonder if this heritability arises because of interaction between genes and environments and so on. And yet there's a puzzle here for evolutionary types because the puzzle is the following. There shouldn't be any heritability at all. Um, standard genetic theory tells us that traits that are strongly related to fitness will have low heritabilities and vice versa. That is, something that is highly related to fitness, like how many fingers I have, how many legs I have, how many ears I have, how many eyes I have, and so on, traits that we think are highly related to fitness, there is no heritability for those traits because there are no individual differences. To a first approximation, if you want to bet with somebody on how many ears somebody has and they're willing to bet that they have fewer than two ears, you're going to make a lot of money because there's no heritability in that trait. And that's because we think that natural selection favors useful combinations of genes so it will drive the best genes to fixation and genetic variants will get used up. So this leaves us in a really unexpected place. Our species has very high heritabilities for traits like intelligence and talents and abilities and psychological traits. And are we really willing to accept that those traits have no relationship to fitness? That would be really rather odd. And so there's this puzzle of heritability. Why is it that genetic variance is maintained for things that ought to be related to our ability to survive and reproduce? Well, the idea of a cultural survival vehicle and a cooperative tribal group gives us an answer to that. And let's have a look because what we see in human groups is an extraordinary degree of individual differences. We can start out with this American basketball player, <coughs> Wilt Chamberlain, and this American horse racing jockey, Willie Shoemaker, and they sort of represent two extremes of, um, in height. And you know, these are real genetic differences between these two guys. We also know that humans seem to show a variety of specific talents. You might be a baker, you might work in this wheel factory, you might be a butcher. I'm not suggesting that there are genes for all these things, but we seem to be able to specialize and trade and exchange the products that we make with others. And this is something that no other species can do. And so we can raise the possibility that in human societies, because we can specialize and trade what we do with others, there has been selection for us to specialize at what we're best at. Because if you do what you're best at, you'll have the most to trade and exchange with others, and so you're most likely to survive and prosper. You won't see this in any other species, because no other species has this cooperative trade and exchange. Now, if we find this far-fetched, we should realize that precisely the same thing has happened to the domesticated dogs. This Chihuahua and this Great Dane are the same species, all dogs can interbreed, if, if with some delicacy in some respects. But, but what these different breeds of dogs represent is a genetic response to the whims of human preferences. And what our individual differences within societies might represent and be responsible for our heritabilities is individuals responding to the various niches that human society opens up for us to specialize at things we're good at. Back in the old days, somebody that tall or somebody that short in most societies would have been very disadvantaged. But Wilt Chamberlain was able to make a lot of money and prosper as a basketball player because there's a specialty in human society for playing basketball. And if you're good enough, you can, you can um, survive and reproduce. And same thing for this very short man here. And so we can ask the question, and it should be really a fundamental question of human societies, have we been sort of cultivated <coughs> by our cultural groups, because we can specialize and cooperate and exchange things amongst one another, have we been cultivated to have genetic differences that otherwise would have been used up by natural selection were we not able to trade and exchange our goods and services? And if we think this is a far-fetched idea, we need only go to more um, traditional 
societies where we see that there are specializations like these Navajo shamans. These are two men here who are ministering to this man here. And these two men don't provide anything of any real value in terms of a material good to their society. But because somehow they're recognized at good at healing, they can specialize at being healers in that society. And the society is willing to support them despite the fact that these men are not hunters, they're not gathering, they're not making the structures that people live in and so on. Their role in society is to be religious healers. And the society is willing to take their product, which is healing people, and return in, in exchange for that um, a living. And in our modern world, we allow priests to do the same thing. They just speak to us and have thoughts and we pay them to do so. And this is a bizarre feature of our societies, this willingness to support people who make no real material contribution to our societies simply because we think they do something of some value. This Tiwi man here making a spear, we can imagine that there are genetic variants that might be such that some people are very, very good at making implements like this, whereas other people are good at being shamans. And again, our societies allow both to specialize, and so that genetic variance can be maintained in our societies in a way that's not available to other animal groups. Artists, the same thing. It's a bit of a bizarre thing that we have artists, artists who just paint things and somehow they can make a living. And that's because somehow we respond to their art in ways that throughout our history, we've been willing to support those people and uh, give them things in exchange for the art they provide to us. And I often like to use this example of the Polynesian long distance sailing. I can imagine that in these people, there were genes that were, made them good at navigating on the open seas and that those genes somehow have been cultivated in those societies. And so we have to ask ourselves the question of whether we have been genetically differentiated by our cultures to fill roles that we are good at. So musical talents, mathematical ability, analytical reasoning, and so on might all be genetic variants that otherwise would have been used up in any other animal society. And I'm just going to close Mark, by saying minutes. that, you know, why does this matter? And this is something that we, we want to ask ourselves if we're trying to unify the biological and the sociocultural sciences. Why does heritability matter? Well, there's a curiosity to it. There's a sort of geneticist's curiosity to it. We'd like to be able to find genes for everything that is heritable. But it has real societal implications. Because if we really do differ in societies genetically, along lines I'm suggesting, that some of us are just genetically good at things that others aren't good at, and we might be good at things that they're bad at, and so on, we differ genetically, then this can have real societal implications. Because most of us would agree that equality of opportunity in society is a good thing. We'd like to have everyone in society have an equal opportunity to be a musician, to be an athlete, to be a mathematician, to be a writer, to be a journalist, so on. And yet, if we differ genetically in those things, if there really is real heritability related to individual differences in human societies, if we differ genetically in those things, what we might be setting up by creating societies with equality of opportunity is a genetic meritocracy. That is, we might be stratifying our societies genetically because equality of opportunity merely guarantees that everybody has an equal chance of being delivered to the door of some opportunity, but it doesn't guarantee that everybody has an equal chance of being good at those things. And so a genetic meritocracy could emerge in a society with perfect equality of opportunity. And so in that sense, I think this is something we want to take care of or want to take seriously. Um, and the, the sort of notion of a cultural survival vehicle and uh, the cooperation and specialization that it allows um, gives us an insight into it that we might not otherwise have. Okay, I'm going to end there and say thank you and hope that the rest of the conference is, is this kind of uh, attempt at synthesis and unification. Thank you. <clears throat>